Welcome to the New York Times Close Up. I'm Clyde Haberman filling in for Sam Roberts. A few weeks ago, Mayor Eric Adams put into motion so-called cleanup teams to remove homeless people from the subways to hopefully move them into shelters. These teams have also been clearing street encampments, also with the hope of moving them into shelters. It's unclear if the city is throwing away people's belongings, though they've promised not to do so. The results have not been encouraging. According to the mayor, about 300 of the subway's homeless had gone into shelters, but it's unclear how many actually stayed there in a system that its users find unsafe and lacking privacy. Many of the people in the encampment simply moved elsewhere. The mayor's done this as the subway system got a new leader after a long time without one. He's Richard A. Davey, a former leader of Boston's transit system. And aside from policing and homeless issues, MTA ridership still remains down. Joining me is Michael Gold, transit reporter for The Times, who's been covering these stories and more. Michael, welcome. Thank you. Can I uh, turn of, to the whole issue of the homeless uh, in, in the subway system? How effective has the effort to um, uh, clear the system of them been? Frankly, from my own ridership, I, I, I don't think it's very, but I could be wrong. I think it depends who you ask. And just to give us a baseline, there are more than 1,000 people who take shelter in the homeless system. It's hard to get an exact number, in part because uh, of the pandemic. The counts that they usually use are a little altered. Um, and like you said, it's about 312 people in the first month who they've moved into shelter. Now, keep in mind that is a significantly higher uh, rate of people per week that they were referring to services before. So it's about 78 people per week. And just in the first week, it was only 22. So they've really accelerated their efforts. At the same time, it's really not clear how many of those people are staying in shelter once they've been referred to services. Uh, the city doesn't have exact numbers on this right now. But before the subway safety plan went into effect, the majority of people who went into shelters would then come back out on the street. Uh, you know, when you talk to officials about this, the mayor or transit officials, they acknowledge that this is going to be a long process and it's going to take time. And part of it is building relationships with people who, for many reasons, are just distrustful of the traditional shelter approach. Is there strong resistance to this plan by the mayors, by advocates for the homeless? I mean, have they, and if there is, have they actually taken legal steps? Advocates for the homeless have been pretty skeptical of this plan, uh, and in part that's because so much of the mayor's plan relies on a heavy police presence. The, the mayor asked for about a thousand more police officers to patrol the system on a regular basis, and by contrast, they're only adding about two dozen social workers to reach out to these folks, uh, mostly at end-of-line stations. So the concern from advocates has been that they're policing homelessness instead of working to, to end it or to refer people to services in need. They haven't made any legal steps toward, toward blocking the plan. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's in the yeah. works or not, but they're definitely watching to see how effective this ends up being. Are. Tell us what we know about uh, Richard Davey, who comes to us from Boston, which has a significant subway system, as we know. He, I guess he has the good fortune not to have Andrew Cuomo as governor anymore because some of Mr. Davey's predecessors ran afoul of the governor for whatever reason and uh, didn't last very long, the, including the immediate uh, guy with the job, uh, Andy Byford, uh, who was very highly regarded and sadly left. So what, what can you tell us about him? Sure, so uh, Richard Davey does come by way of Boston. He was the head of the MBTA, which is the equivalent of the MTA. Right. Uh, and after that, he ran the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. He took it over at a time when they were saddled with debt based on some previous projects, and he had to kind of figure out how they were going to fund transportation projects. And it's also worth mentioning uh, that MassDOT, the transportation department up there, is actually also in charge of public transit. So even when he was stepped away from being in charge of the MBTA, he still had his hands in the transit pot. He uh, spent the last few years working at uh, Boston Consulting Group, where he was a partner mostly focusing on public transit. Right. And one of the things that Jano Lieber, the chairman of the MTA, has said is that he liked that uh, Mr. Davey comes with the experience of looking at transit systems all the world, uh, all over the world. And Davey has said that he's going to bring some of the lessons he's learned from those projects and see what he can do in New York. Do we know which cities in particular? No, he won't say, citing client mm. confidentiality. But we know that he worked with uh, Washington D.C. Okay. on their bus transformation plan, London, which is Paris, uh, possibly. Moscow, he's been very vague. Okay. I've asked yeah. um, <laughs> some Europe, again. some Asia. We'll see. We're going to keep right. bothering. Well, I spent years in Tokyo, and he could certainly learn a lot from there. I was in Tokyo for five years, and in five years, and, and using the subways quite regularly, mm. I was not on a train that came so much as a minute late. So, well, yeah, and that would be a great lesson for us to uh, to take here. It's it's interesting. He had his first 
a major press conference yesterday. And, you know, on Monday, one day before that, right. um, he, the subway had a meltdown. And so right. it was sort of interesting for him to have to take questions from the press about that, I think. And, and uh, He said that he'd like to speed up buses. Uh, I've been hearing that for a long time from yes. various officials. How doable, and what do we have a sense of what would make it doable? So a major challenge for uh, the MTA in this regard is that they really have to work with the city to get this done, because while the MTA runs the buses, the city runs the streets. Right. Mayor Adams has signaled his openness toward adding more bus lanes. Uh, the commissioner, Udanis Rodriguez, has also said that he'd like to see more work on bus lanes. So we'll see. I think this is a much more cooperative, collaborative area between uh, the MTA and the city than had been in the past. You know, under uh, Governor Cuomo, um, there were a lot of squabbles between the city and state, and the MTA was kind of caught in the middle. So to put it mildly. Yeah. yeah so we'll see uh, how much can be achieved. Do we know what kind of relationship Mr. Davey has with Governor Hochul? I mean, are they, we don't. He said that one of the things that uh, led him to take the job was the belief that the governor stands behind. Uh, Jana Lieber stands behind improving transit, that she seems really committed to it. Uh, we'll see what happens when he gets here. I think Andy Byford came in with the best of intentions, and then a few years later he left because of squabbling. So yeah. it's, it's a tough job. I think that's why people haven't traditionally lasted. But it's, It is a very tough job. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask about crime? Um, obviously, it's everybody's concern. Uh, but there's a part of me that wonders, do, are we over without minimizing some of the awful crimes that have taken place, women pushed to the tracks, for mm -hmm. example, are we over worrying this issue, perhaps? I mean, I mean, older New Yorkers will remember the 1970s when, when thing, the, the system in the city itself was, they both seemed out of control. Is this a dominant concern for the, um, for the managers of the system? And related to that, the, uh, experimentation with um, glass panels uh, mm. uh, to keep people uh, from being shoved onto tracks, either on purpose or, or accidentally, uh, where that will stand and, and how, what can we expect out of that? Yeah, we can start with the panels. That's a much okay. easier question to answer. Okay. So this will be a pilot program at three stations. It's going to take a while because the, as... The three being, sorry to interrupt, with uh, Times Square for sure. The Times Square 7 platform, right. the 14th uh, Street and 3rd Avenue L stop, okay. and then um, I believe it's the E platform at uh, Jamaica Archer where you can catch the, the air train transfer. Right. Exactly. So uh, the timing on this, I don't want to put a firm commitment on it. The MTA has to procure a contract. There's a lot of studies. It will take construction. And it's starting with three stations. There are 472. Uh, many of those stations have multiple platforms, so we'll see. Um, it has proven effective in other systems, not just at you know safety, but in terms of speeding right. up the trains a little bit. New York is a little different. We have a massive aging system, and I think you see these platform doors in a lot of newer systems, especially in Asia and, and newer sure. stations where they've been designed for the beginning. Uh, so we'll see what happens with those. I think it's not coming within the year, but maybe next year or the year but after. But do we have a sense of, you know, I I've long heard, you know, well, it's hard to do that in New York mm -hmm. because fill in the blank. Usually the blank is filled with it's an aging system. Right. London's is older. Boston's mm -hmm. is older. Uh, I think Paris is, is older. Uh, and somehow they've managed to have some of these innovations. So is that just a catch-all excuse in New York for things not getting done? I think it's a mix of things. You, you know, the, um, the MTA actually did a, commissioned a, a very large <laughs> major study on this, and the majority of stations would require significant alterations to accommodate them. I mean, one thing to think about when you're looking at above ground stations, there's some concerns about whether they could support whatever added weight would be required by these mechanisms. At the same time, we have had new stations being built. We've had renovations on significant stations. You know, when they built the Hudson Yard station, they talked about whether it would be feasible to do this. When they built the Second Avenue subway stations uh, uptown, they talked about whether it would be feasible mm -hmm. to do this. There are a lot of factors. Cost is a big one, certainly. Uh, the MTA obviously has had some financial issues, both when it comes to construction and operations. I think this is going to be an interesting first step to see, you know, what, yeah. what can be done. And I often find that with some of these things, once you take the first step, it ends up being easier implementation-wise than you thought, if not from the construction perspective. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Things don't tend to get done very swiftly in this city, I'm afraid. An article that you wrote the other day said that subway ridership is up to 58% of, mm. of where it was in 2019. 
Is there any reason to believe we can get to 100% at any point, or are we going to be resigned to fewer riders, uh, at least for the foreseeable future, given altered work patterns, uh, commute patterns have changed? Uh, do, do, the, do the masters of, of the subways have a sense of where they're going to be a year from now, two years from now, assuming we don't have a new plague? Well, the MTA's uh, own projections that they've been using to, to track ridership and predict the future, I guess, as it were, yeah. only have them at uh, 85% by 2024, 2025. So I think they're acknowledging that it's that it's going to take a while for ridership to climb back. And I think it's worth noting that those projections were done before Delta and before Omicron. And I think we saw a lot of companies start to alter what the office would look like and what commuting would look like. So I think they're acknowledging that we're not going to be in the same reality. We left the system in February 2020, and they're going to have to find a way to account for that. At the same time, they're really focused on bringing back as many riders as they can. And, and uh, crime is a major part of that. That's one of the things right. that they've been focused on to bring it back to your earlier question. Riders have said they don't feel safe on the subway and that that's one of the major yeah. reasons that they're not taking the system. Numbers wise, crime is down compared to before the pandemic. But when you look at the rate per million riders, it's the, rates, the, the rate's up and there are fewer people on the yeah. train, so. No question. Although I do think fear tends to outdistance reality much of the time, and this is maybe one of those occasions. Well, for months, uh, officials said this was largely a perception issue, and yeah. I think the mayor has acknowledged that perception is a major part of the problem, and one of the reasons both he and the MTA wanted to have more police officers actively patrolling stations was to reassure people. Right, but you have to deal with perceptions, obviously. And Yeah, of course. Um, we don't have much time, but uh, subway finances is mm. probably one of those subject matters that makes a lot of viewers and readers' <laughs> eyes glaze over, but it is critical. I presume that there are millions in federal aid that have been infused in this system that ain't going to last forever. So what happens next year, the year after, and so on? Federal aid is keeping the system afloat. I don't think that's yeah. an exaggeration. It's they have a balanced projected budget through 2024. Uh, it looks like also maybe through 2025, we haven't seen the updated plans. They're looking at a $2 billion deficit in 2026. And uh, Jenna Lieber, the MTA's chair, has been saying we need to think of another way to fund transit. We can't rely on fares. You know, they used to get 40% of their revenue from fares. No. The latest budget production, I think, was closer to 32. I'm not sure off the top of my head, but right. most of the gap is being made up by federal aid, which right. is going to run out. And Absolutely. there's no guarantee that we'll have an administration in 2024 when this starts to become a crisis that will be as friendly to transit as President Biden is. So it's hard to say. OK, well, you'll be watching it for us. And that's great. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael Gold. Next stuff, we're going to have a new season of baseball. Yay. Welcome back. For a while, the 2022 baseball season seemed in peril. An owner-imposed lockout led to difficult negotiations with the players union on one side and the commissioner and the owners on the other. Luckily for us baseball fans, reason saved the day and a new season has begun, albeit a bit later than planned. Baseball has changed. Games are longer, pitches are more dominant, infielders are spread all over, and the Cleveland Indians are now the Cleveland Guardians. Salaries are up but overall attendance is down. The game is in a precarious place, I might say, and yet here we are ready for another season of Yankees and Mets baseball. David Waldstein is a sports reporter for The Times who has covered baseball and other sports for years. Welcome, David. I am excited about this new season, uh, but a lot of fans may not be. Attendance, even before uh, COVID, attendance at the ballpark was down. Uh, I think it peaked at something where my cheat sheet here, 79 and a half million in 2007. Last year it was more like 49 and a half million. Uh, and obviously that's COVID affected. What explains the decline? Um, it's not been the plunge to 49 million, but bit by bit over the last 15 years, uh, ballparks are getting fewer people. Uh, is the game losing its oomph? Uh, comparatively, yes, it really is. And it's, um, there's a, many, many devoted fans. There are more people that go to baseball games than go to football, basketball, and so forth. Right. Maybe not on average, but there are so many games. And as you pointed out, since 2008, we've pretty much seen a decline every year. Yeah. Um, and there, there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, it's not considered as, as hip as it used to be. It's slower. The pace of game is slower. The games are longer. 
And in recent years, there's been a preponderance of the th so-called three true outcomes, which is a strikeout, a home run, right. or a walk, and it's boring. It's and boring. baseball is addressing all of these issues pretty much with uh, Theo Epstein, the former whiz kid uh, general manager of the Boston Red Sox yes. and Chicago Cubs. He's now working for MLB, and it's basically his mission to tweak the game to get it back to the way it was in the 80s and 90s when it was when the, it was the players on the field athletic dramatic players that decided the outputs not a team of nerds in the front office figuring out <laughs> algorithms right algorithms uh, which i frankly don't understand a lot of them you mentioned the length of games uh last season 2021 it was three the average game lasted three hours and ten minutes when i was a lad admittedly a long long time ago it was a lot closer to two hours and 10 minutes, maybe a little bit longer. So let's say an hour. Um, clearly, attention spans have shrunk over the last uh, decades uh, to go along with this. So how do they speed it up? Uh, I know they, I, I can't be the only one who doesn't believe that batters have to step out of the batter's box after every pitch, whose batting gloves somehow miss mysteriously unhinge uh, each time and have to be redone and pitchers have to walk around the mound as if it was the holy you know, land. Uh, this is going to change. This is well, going to okay. change. Uh, but how? This might be the last season we ever see without a pitch clock. Okay. And that's going to be the fundamental thing because you, 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 you talked about the, the length of games overall, but what's right. really the issue is the pace of play between pitches. And the the... Baseball has done studies and figured out that the time between a batted ball in play is, can be four minutes, more than four minutes oh on God. average. That's amazing. It's amazing. And the time between pitches can be 30 seconds. So they're going to introduce a pitch clock, which they're already experimenting with in the minor leagues. It's inevitable that they're going to adopt it. It'll probably be around... 19 seconds, 18 seconds with no one on base, uh, excuse me, with a runner on base, and uh, maybe 14 seconds with no one on base. And it is going to make a big difference. Batters will have to be in the batter's box, okay. attentive to the pitch within nine seconds. So they can't, you got, you've got nine seconds to, <laughs> to futz around with your yeah. gloves yeah. and to look around and get your sign from the third base coach and then get in the box and be ready for the pitch. And the pitcher has to throw it within between 14 and say 18, 19 seconds, they're still working on that. That's gonna make a big difference. I hope so. Uh, if you go back, excuse me. No, please. If you go back to and pick a U2 game, a World Series game from the 60s or yeah. 70s, and the, the rhythm of the pitcher catching the ball back from the catcher, looking in, throwing the pitch, oh. is so much better. Without question. And they wanna get back to that. So they're, they're tweaking the game, in many different ways, they're tweaking the strike zone. They're tweaking the, the where batters can the fielders can position themselves, all intended to get more action on the field and faster. Is there a commercial aspect to this? I mean, you sell more beer at the ballpark if you have another hour or so. Of yeah, but play in there, but but overall, you want popularity. Right. You okay. want and you're and it's that's that's the goal is to get it. You know. Basket NBA games, which can be terminable at the interminable at the ends with with with, oh, with timeouts, timeouts, well, foul well, shots. Right. It's it can be excruciating. Right. But those games are you know two and a half hours right. on average. Same with hockey games, and football games. They're three hours, but it's a once a week ritual. I could even take four hours of a, of a football <laughs> game. But but I I think the 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 goal is to just make it so so when you're sitting there watching a game on TV. I, when I watch a game on TV now, the pitch is thrown, it's a ball or a swinging strike, and I, I start, you know, switching around I think because we, I have time to get back. I think we all do. I think yeah. I've made sandwiches in between pitches. <laughs> um, another bugaboo of mine is the, uh, the infield shifts. Uh, three guys on uh, one side or the other instead of two on one, two on the other. So a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, uh, seeing eye hits get 
outs become outs. Uh, is there any uh, thought of uh, limiting this in some yep. fashion? And yep. what might that be without, again, interfering the, with the manager's right to put his players wherever he wants them? Well, he's limited already with the pitcher and the catcher. Pitcher has to stand on the rubber. Right. Catcher has to be behind home plate okay. in that box. Yeah, it's hard so to change that. You can't, you can't make a blanket statement saying that you know, you're allowed to position your defense anywhere you want. There already are restrictions. They are going to, they're working on this, and they're probably going to adopt a rule that says you have to have two batters on either, two fielders on mm -hmm. either side of second base. And there's a, there's a balance there because you're, you're kind of helping out the left-handed pull hitter that all he can do is, is pull the ball, and he's not learning, you're not, you're not developing players that can hit the ball against the shift. And why is that happening? I mean, the way to stop the shift is if you have three guys on the first base side of the infield, let's say, bunt. Yeah, it goes to, back to, to the, the algorithm. third base, and that's... And, it goes back to the algorithm. And, and they'll have to, you'll, you'll have, you're forcing them to be honest that way. Right. They, they've calculated, the front offices, the, 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 the mathematicians have calculated that, the, that it's great, the, the probability of success is greater if you just let these guys swing away and try to hit a home run than if he bunts and gets on first base. He probably won't come around. And You're score. telling me I shouldn't have enjoyed Moneyball as much as I did. Yeah, correct. And you know what's really interesting? Is Theo was part of that evolution. Right. I mean, he really, he got the Red Sox doing it, he got the Cubs doing it even more. He helped, you know, direct the game into this sort of analytical approach, which is kind of killing it. And now he's putting that, his same, in, you know, in, intelligence into correcting it, yeah. getting it back on, in, in balance. Uh, at the risk of being accused of geezeritis, of always <laughs> wanting everything to be the way it was when I was a kid, um, Another thing that has me wondering is the expansion, again, of the number of teams that are going to qualify for the playoffs. So 12 teams will qualify. That's 40% of the teams. To me, one of the glories of baseball was it rewarded success over the long run. Uh, the best teams basically lose two out of five uh, games. Uh, uh, and and it, it's, it's what real life is about to me, mm -hmm. uh, over 162 games. And now... A team can slide in uh, and get hot for a few weeks at the end of the season and win the World Series. And I can't be the only one who thinks this isn't uh, an orderly universe. I agree. With you. I, I completely agree with you. And, and with such a long season, it, it waters down the meaning of it. And then you have all these games that don't really matter. Yeah. So... I agree that it would be, I, I, I liked it the old way, get, you know, four teams just go right to the, to the NLCS, but they, they expanded right. in 95 and everybody was happy with that. So they'll probably just keep doing it and turning it well, into they basketball. Want, the owners wanted to go to 14 teams, yeah. uh, almost half, almost half the, right. the, the number of teams. Yep. One last uh, sort of, I guess, uh, geezer question <laughs> of, uh, well, pitchers uh, and pitch counts and these guys have to be in infinitely better shape than the pitchers of 20 years ago, let alone 50 years ago. Why do they seem so fragile? They can't pitch more than, you know, 80 pitches and, oh, the pitch count's getting up there and, and, and endless Tommy John surgeries and so on. Uh, what am I missing here? I think it's because as much conditioning as you can do and working with weights and stretching and all that, yeah. you can't, you can't strengthen yeah. this, yeah. the ulnar collateral ligament. Okay. It is what it is, and it's one of my favorite ligaments. Yeah. yeah well, we all love it, <laughs> um, and it, it, uh, you know, it's it's fragile, especially when you put that much torque on it. Yeah. So, and even strengthening up could put more pressure on it and make it more vulnerable. So it's just, I think in the old days, my, my uncle was a, a, a triple A pitcher huh. and he developed uh, elbow pain. He was a lefty, developed elbow pain. Bad. And back then, he's like, there was no surgery. Like, you just pitch through it until your ERA gets over five and, and then, then you're, you're out. out. Right. You know, but and nowadays- that happened, it, that happened to him? Yeah, that's what happened to him. So he was in the Tigers system, pitched yeah. in Buffalo and yeah, he just tried to pitch through it, and you can't. 
Do you want to forecast a season for us with no uh, no penalties? Should you <laughs> I mean, in terms of uh, the local teams, the Yankees, my team, I, Bronx born, and the Mets, uh, uh, the Mets have spent a ton of money under their relatively new owner, Mr. Cohn. So. And they brought in a really smart manager with Buck Showalter. Yeah. I expect big things for the Mets. I think they're going to make a World Series push. Um, the Yankees will be in the playoffs, but I've just seen this too many times in the last few years where they they can't advance and they get really close. They've gotten to Game Sevens, but they but I'm just so I think they'll be in the playoffs. I don't think they'll make the World Series, and a lot depends on you know Garrett Cole. What is Garrett Cole? Did he yeah. does he need the sticky stuff? You know, <laughs> and and we still don't really know the answer to is that. Is he accused of that or suspected? I should. Well, he was. He basically admitted it last okay. year, and uh, when they outlawed it, his he didn't perform as well. Uh, and it was, you know, it was basically a half a season or so. But we we will find out this year if he made an adjustment. All right. Well, go Yankees, go Mets. Thank you, David Waldstein, for the New York Times and CUNY TV. I'm Clyde Haberman.